This is Digital Health Today, episode 53. Most companies come in sort of thinking they're ready for seed investments. We kind of have a show of hands and everybody raises their hands. Like, yes, I'm also out raising seed money. And by the end of that, they all, no one really raises their hand. They say, I now know what I need to do in the next two to three to four months so that I can really go out and use my time efficiently. And when I go to raise a seed round, I'm going to be successful at doing that. Welcome to Digital Health Today, the podcast focused on the leaders, innovators, and technologies transforming healthcare today and tomorrow. Find us online at digitalhealthtoday.com. This episode is brought to you by Bear Grants for Apps and their new generator program. Bear Grants for Apps invites you to submit your innovative healthcare projects for one of their four challenge areas. Learn more and apply online at g4agenerator.com by March 23rd. Welcome back to Digital Health Today, the place to be to get the insights of leaders working to make the healthcare of tomorrow available today. I'm your host, Dan Kendall, and this is episode 53. What a week it's been in California. I'm actually recording this while I'm still on the road. I've been in San Francisco for a packed lineup of conferences, events, and meetings, and then I headed down to Palo Alto to spend some time with people from IDEO, Medible, Stanford Center for Biodesign, Exponential Medicine, Roche, and many others. Now, everyone knows there's a ton happening in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area, and I've managed to get a load of content that I'll be sharing with you over the coming weeks. I've done dozens of interviews with leaders and innovators, and I'm excited to bring you the audio interviews, plus some that I captured on video with my friend Mike Evans. Mike is the guy behind live telesurgery and clinical video company, Box Line Box. You can check out their work at boxlinebox.com. Mike, thanks for joining me in San Francisco, and thanks to everyone who made time to say hello and give us an update on what you're working on. Mike and I did some filming at the Startup Health Festival last week, and we had a really good time there. In fact, one of my favorite things during the two days of the Startup Health Festival was a talk by former Vice President Joe Biden. It was a powerful speech, and people were talking about it for the rest of the week. It's going to be available online, but it's not available at the time of this recording, so keep an eye out for that video. It shook the ground of the event in a very constructive way. 2017 was a standout year in digital health in a variety of ways. One key metric is funding. Startup Health reported the year closed at $11.5 billion in investments in digital health companies in 2017, topping 2016's record of $8 billion. Series A funding grew its share of overall funding for the third year in a row. It is now 36% of the total funding in digital health startups. While seed funding has grown in terms of real dollars, the share of the funding pie has continued to decline since 2015, but it still makes up 29% of the overall funding in digital health startups. My observation, after having spent hours and days in meetings over the past week and a half, is that most people expect 2018 to be a very dynamic year in terms of funding activity, mergers and acquisitions, and some breakout success stories. One thing's for sure, it's going to be very interesting as we continue to see tech companies move into the health space and health companies move into the tech space. So going back to the point about seed funding, let me talk about today's guest. Fred Tony is the CEO and co-founder of Launchpad Digital Health, which is the most active institutional lead investor in digital health at the seed stage in the U.S. Fred has more than 20 years of financial and executive management experience in digital health, medical, life sciences, and financial sectors. He served in executive and board capacities for 30 public and private companies, and he's founded, funded, managed, and sold numerous companies. And to top it all off, he's now a board member or board observer for over 20 digital health companies. Fred and I recorded this interview over the holidays, so we didn't have the full 2017 numbers to discuss. But we covered some of the tips for companies looking for seed funding, some of the areas that they're focused on at Launchpad Digital Health, and the success that they're having in identifying and supporting female-led startups. He's also shared some information about their Ground Zero program, and you can download that from the website. We talked about it here on this podcast, but we also have some information available on the website. Just visit digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 53 for links to all the resources and all the companies that we discussed on this episode. So now let's tune into the conversation with Fred Tony. Fred, thanks for joining me. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Dan. Fred, I've given the listeners a little bit of background. Can you just give us a quick snapshot of your journey all the way from research analyst to now CEO and co-founder of a digital health accelerator? Sure. 25 years in the healthcare space. It's been a, uh, a time where there's been lots of change. Transformation's been uh, throughout, but research analyst, partner at two different investment banking firms for about 10 years, doing lots of M&A transactions and IPOs and follow-on fundings following the healthcare IT space and, and medical technology. And through the dot-com era, went off to be a CFO and then CEO of Health Central, 
and did the IPO there in 1999, and then CEO of a public company. Always an interesting experience. Uh, we grew a lot. We ended up selling that business off in five different pieces. Then as CEO uh, or co-founder and executive chairman at Rx List, where we were the largest prescription drug information source of information on the internet, and we had lots of B2B customers and lots of B2C customers, grew that for about four years, it was a perfect fit with WebMD. They came to us and we fairly quickly did a sale to them, which was a great exit and still became and, and still is today a very big part of WebMD's offering. And then lots of medical device companies investing and lots of healthcare IT companies investing over the last decade or more. Four years ago, decided that we wanted to start a different kind of early fund investor, which also included an immersion program. Lots of accelerators at the time were just short-term programs. And we decided that we really needed three things. One, giving companies plenty of seed capital uh, and then more time to execute, and then the ability to have deep immersion for a year or more, which they do here in San Francisco with us. And really just wanted to be as good a mentor to companies at the early stage that that I had had through my career, folks like the chairman at uh, Health Central who founded Preview Travel and was vice chairman at Travelocity, Jim Hornthal, guys like Paul Brown, who was uh, my senior at uh, at Volpe when I was a young research analyst, and people that really had uh, continued to be mentors to me throughout my career. We wanted to be great mentors to young companies and teams that really wanted to grow in digital health, and that's really the genesis of starting Launchpad Digital Health in a very different fashion than anything else that was available at the time, and pleased that in that four years, we've now grown to be the leading U.S. seed investor in digital health that leads those deals. So we've led all the deals that we've done. So I feel like I should ask everyone this that comes on the show because the answers are similar, but usually distinctly different. How do you actually define digital health? Great question. We get asked it a lot. We've always thought it's really the intersection of technology, mobile applications, healthcare, changing regulatory environment. And at the center of that is, is really the proliferation of data but data that can be very, very useful. So we throw the net very wide in digital health. We tend to not do hardware-related digital health sensors and the like, but we, we really focus on cloud-based services and software. And then we have a bar. We, from the beginning, we said we really wanted to do, this whole industry is going to move toward outcomes and quality. And so we always said medical-grade digital health, meaning there had to be a certain level of efficacy and benefit to patients and users. And so that's how we define it today. And that's how we define what we do. So you started Launchpad Health in 2014. In your literature, it says that Launchpad is the leading seed investor in digital health in the US. You've made about uh, over 40 investments across 28 digital health companies. How do you how do you evidence that position as the leading seed investor? And what have you done to make that position a reality? We evidence the leading seed investor in digital health that leads deals. So there are lots of small angels or incubators or accelerators that make very small investments in lots and lots of deals. And, and that's not what we do. We lead these rounds. And so there aren't a lot of leads in the seed area and particularly in digital health. So we're the leading lead investor in seed investing for digital health. And there's just nobody out there leading the kind of uh, volume of deals that we do. We do make investments in groups typically, so about every nine months we'll make another six or eight investments, and we've grown into that position just organically. We've, we originally said we're going to do it every six to 12 months. We don't have a mandate to do 10 or 20 companies a cohort. We can only do, you know, we can do one or five or 10, but whatever, whatever we need to. So we, we tended to settle around five to eight deals per cohort. And, uh, and we just focused on quality, and it grew from there. And to get 28 companies that you're invested in, how many companies do you need to look at? We've looked at over 1,000, maybe 1,500 by now. So every nine months when we get applications in, and we get them continually now, we have great deal flow. We get about three to 400 new applications for everything from three folks in a penciled-out business plan to – companies that have been at this for a couple of years looking for seeding seed capital. 
And so we tend to focus on those that have a little bit of market traction, certainly not enough for an A round or not enough for bigger institutional investors, but enough evidence that they have a product and it's either launched or about to be launched and enough customer feedback where they really have some usage and we can have some evidence that this is something that customers like. Uh, it can scale very large and there's a team in place that can execute. Yeah, I want to go over that just again because I speak to a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs who think that seed investors are who you go to when you have your idea. And you just mentioned that you see various submissions where people just have you know a business plan sketched out. Just to be clear then, who are the right sorts of companies or entrepreneurs that, that should come to an organization like yours or yours specifically? Where should they be and what sort of evidence should they have? For an investment, a real seed investment, companies really do need to have bootstrapped for some period of time, probably raise some friends and family or angel money early on, and they have some semblance of a minimum viable product or are working toward it very rapidly. So it's really not at the inception stage. So for a portfolio investment, it really takes a lot of these companies have been at it a year, been at it two years. We get a lot of companies out of the Stanford Biodesign Program. I just saw eight last week. All of them are too early, but all of them are potential candidates a year from now uh, because they have about a year's worth of work to do. So it's really that early semblance of some customer need and feedback and then that they're building a product that is then, from a technology standpoint, a deplorable standpoint, can really scale. We can't dive into all 28 companies that you've invested in, but we'll make sure we link to all of them in the show notes for this episode. So we'll have all the companies listed and direct links to all of their websites. But can you tell us just about a couple of them that maybe illustrate the sort of scope and impact that you're making through Launchpad? Sure. Uh, companies like Life Dojo, who are in the corporate wellness space, so they're selling to self-insured employers, which usually get about 5% participation rate in their corporate wellness programs. Life Dojo gets about 35, 40% participation rate. And the reason they do is their programs are much deeper and they're employee choice based. So if the corporate wellness program is all about nutrition or fitness. So in fitness, you could choose one of 12 or 14 different activities. The employee feels like they have more buy-in. They have a coach each week for, for 15 minutes. And then there's a technology platform on the back end that tracks their activity that they've chosen. So the outcomes are much better. The habit changing works better. They've really got the best product in the marketplace. And they went to a company called Sodexo, a Fortune 25 company, global 25 company. And I am partnered with them to really roll that out to a much larger distribution channel because Sodexo's got hundreds of companies that are Fortune 500 corporate clients already. So they're scaling very well. That's a good example. Another example, Elemento Health, we just invested in recently, and I think there's a press release out on today. And Elemento's taking best practices inside healthcare providers, so inside the hospital walls or outpatient clinics, and things like IV line changes that everyone knows how to do and they were trained some way, but they might not be using best practice and therefore infection rates are high. So they did a study at UCSF where one of their training videos was best practices for line changes for IVs. And by doing that and putting it on a phone at the point of care, so every caregiver has it at the front line of care, they were able to reduce line infections by 50%. Every time there's an IV line infection, it adds two or three hospital days, three or $4,000 a day. It's very expensive. So it's really putting safety and best practices and risk controls out into the caregiver's hands and at the front line of care, which allows them to have a huge impact. And they've already signed up their first four or five customers and they're starting to scale well. I guess the other one I'll mention is Stop, Breathe, and Think, uh, a little bit outside the traditional healthcare system. But Stop, Breathe, and Think is not just another meditation app. Uh, it's focused on emotional well-being for the age group of 25 and under. Kids are having a lot more anxiety and depression than they did before. Social media may have something to do with that. There's a lot of research around this area, but they have a platform so for daily interaction and daily meditation for uh, four to 10 year olds and then 11 to 25 year olds, two different applications. And they will be publishing soon. They have clinical evidence, a research study coming out where they have shown specifically that they can lower anxiety 
statistically significantly in 25 and under kids and young adults by doing uh, and not uh, they can do that initially and they can do it over a long period of time. And so really having an impact on people's lives and uh, saving a lot of money over long term in the mental health arena. So those are three good examples. We've got a lot more. We've got a lot more companies I could talk about. Sure. Um, well, like I said, we'll make sure we include links to all of them in the show notes for this so people will be able to find it. Those are great examples. I especially like the last one that you mentioned because it's really focusing on that younger age group. And I'm reading more and more. I'm a parent of two daughters. And you know, I, I see uh, or I'm hearing so much about uh, the children who have their phones and are getting anxiety and the bullying that's happening. We're seeing, hearing that on the news all the time. And an actual addiction to technology that some teenagers are forming. So it's good to see that there's a, a mental health solution that's being targeted to that younger group. I too have two girls, so we've got that in common. Mine are slightly older, 12 and a half and 15, Eva and Charlotte. And the use of social media it has really proliferated. Their friends are, you know, it's it's primary form of communication. And I think a lot of the research studies that are out in the last couple of years show a spike and anxiety, depression, uh, mental health issues with younger kids, and specifically with girls, which have a three or four times higher rate of, of those things than, than boys do. So I have them as uh, test cases for some of the products, and they've been testing those out and really love it. It's a great solution to people 25 and under. Right. Yeah, I'll take a look at those as well. Now, I noticed that 25% of the companies you've invested in have CEOs that are women. And that's simply not typical in Silicon Valley. Some of the figures I've seen have put investment in women-led companies at less than 3% of the investments made in companies led by men. And if you just look at the percentages by the number of companies, the figures uh, in terms of how many are led by women, the figures vary between, I've seen numbers from 6 to 11%, depending on the size of the company and the stage. How have you managed to have 25% of your portfolio, that's seven out of the 28 companies you've invested in? led by women? Was this a conscious undertaking or did, were you just in the right place at the right time? We didn't set out to back female CEOs. What we set out to do is find the best digital health companies we can find. Maybe there was a subconscious, I think, at work. I've always worked with a lot of very good uh, senior level executive women at the companies I've been at and hired a lot of them at senior levels. And so the later in life when I had uh, when I had two daughters, maybe there's a subconscious working there that really wants me to really empower women and help them in any way that I can. So we were just really set out looking for great digital health companies. And it just turns out that we're finding a lot that are run by women. And frankly, all the ones we've invested in that are run by women are doing extremely well. I think there is something to higher performance level overall. So now it's sort of flipped the other way. We're seeking them out really trying to fund companies that are run by strong, well-organized, thoughtful CEOs. And we're having a lot of success at that. And so very proud of that. And we're going to continue to do more of it. We've uh, one of our advisory board members, Catherine Stickney, started an organization recently called Parity.org. It's based on the Tony Dungy rule in the NFL, where you agree to interview minorities. In this case, with Parity.org, you take the pledge to interview women for all your senior level positions, which we've taken. We were one of the early ones and a lot of companies are taking now because when you interview more of them, you're going to end up hiring more of them. Uh, it's a great organization that's really pushing it. We're, we've been behind that and we try and uh, work that into the fabric of everything we're doing. A lot of people are, are coming to us because of that fact now. And uh, we're seeing a lot of good deal flow of companies run by women. Michelle Longmire at Metabol. Bronwyn Harris at Tuio, uh, Julie Campus trying to stop, breathe, and think, uh, and others that are really doing a fantastic job. We'll get right back to the interview, but I wanted to take a minute to tell you about our partnership with Bayer and their Grants for Apps program. After five years of success with the G4A Accelerator program and the Dealmaker program that was just introduced in 2017, Bayer has introduced another new program to help foster partnerships between Bayer and early stage companies. Similar to the Dealmaker program, the new Generator program is designed to establish commercial relationships with companies developing solutions that focus on their four challenge areas. This program is about making self-care accessible and achievable, and they're looking to tackle the challenges of managing self-care, external pain management, improving skin and sun protection, and nutrition support. The prize for this program is perhaps one of the most valuable of all, a commercial relationship with a global corporate customer. Applications open the week of January 8, 2018, but don't delay. The deadline to apply is March 23, 2018. 
Get full details on their website at g4agenerator.com. That's G, the number four, A, generator.com. Now let's jump back to the conversation. So 2017 is a record year for investments in digital health. Q3 numbers as of the end of Q3 2017, uh, latest numbers we have at the time of this recording, surpassed the total in 2016. So I think it's projected we'll end at over $10 billion of investment in 2017. That's 4x what it was in, in 2012 at about two and a quarter billion. What's your prediction for 2018? Are you expecting another record year? Are you expecting this to be the real curve of the hockey stick? Yeah, every year we've we've been uh, we've been pleased with the amount of investment coming into the space. I, I don't see it slowing down anytime. I don't I don't know if it'll be another record or not. But more and more funds that two and three years ago might do one or two digital health deals are now doing, you know, four, five, six, seven in the space. It's really become more of a defined space in itself, outside of traditional med device or life sciences or traditional tech or IT, and so. It's really become more, uh, we, we see a lot more follow-on funds that have it as a category and a focus. So I don't see it slowing down at all. I think there are still lots of seed deals happening, lots of mid-range company deals happening, and then lots of bigger deals happening too. I did read a report last week that talked about valuations coming back down to earth in the seed rounds. We've always, uh, most of the companies we, we invest in at the seed level have always been in that three to five million pre-money valuation, maybe two to five million pre-money valuation range. I think a lot of deals kind of got a little frothy on the seed level and, and some valuations moved up. We did not follow those, but I think staying disciplined at the seed level is, is important. But we really don't see it slowing down, Dan, and the deal flow we see is, is still uh, increasing uh, you know, every quarter. So when companies join your organization, when they receive investment from Launchpad, what do you offer the companies? So the biggest thing is we have them co-locate with us here in San Francisco in our three-story digital health hub right, right next to Twitter and Dolby and, and Uber. And they are immersed in a digital health environment. And so there's 15 or 20 companies in the building, all digital health companies, all focused on similar markets and customers and issues and problems. And so... Combined with that and continual mentoring. So this morning, I had, uh, I've had i seen four of the CEOs of public companies, two of them I had long meetings with, two of them I had very short conversations with, but all impactful about what they're doing with their business and helping them solve problems all along the way. It's very different than a traditional venture fund that uh, might meet them every couple of months or every uh, quarter at a board meeting or maybe a check-in every now and then. We're really helping them solve problems on a weekly basis, and seed companies all have big problems, and every week they're solving something new. And so that immersion, surrounded by our advisory board that's very involved as well, is a really big benefit to the companies. So they're here in Silicon Valley, they're from all over the world, and that helps with connections, but it's really helping them solve problems on a weekly basis that makes all the difference. And bringing people on our advisory board or other people outside to bear on problems that they're having to help them solve them and be successful. And, and that's really the difference. And that's really the benefit of Launchpad Digital Health. It's just why we've kind of become known as the place. If you really want to build a digital health company that's robust and sustainable and can scale, this is the place to go. And what are some of the companies that are also supporting the startups in your group? So we have lots of corporate partnerships. Um, the folks at Wilson Sonsini, big uh, biggest Silicon Valley law firm, their partners are all accessible for office hours around patents or technology or contracting or, or boards and startups. Things like that. Uh, we've got PR agencies. We've got technology partnerships with companies like Xcube. If people are looking to outsource some of their technology build, it's a big firm that does that, done a lot in the healthcare space companies, Amazon Web Services, they get lots of credits there. We've surrounded them with a group of service providers, but then also uh, I think equally important is the advisory board that has tremendous experience within life sciences, devices, technology in, in all aspects. And so those folks are really as important partners as our, as our service provider partners are. 
And we can't forget to mention the Ground Zero program that you've developed. Now, this is for companies that are not ready for the seed investment that you offer. Can you tell us about this? It's a one-month immersion program, I understand. So can you tell us about how it works and what it offers? Sure. Similarly to how I just described our portfolio company, Immersion, it's uh, it's a bit more curriculum-based. And we decided to add this about a year and a half ago because we saw so many companies that were interesting, like the ones I mentioned out of Stanford Biodesign earlier, that really needed work to figure out all the aspects of their business and pressure test it with customers. And so we designed a program around 13 or 14 different curriculum-based modules, have them come in for a month or two. Companies can actually stay up to three months under this program, but it's the first month is really the most intensive part. And there are classroom lectures around different topics. They are required to go out and talk to customers and get feedback between Every one to two days, we'll come back for another session and they will have to report on their customer findings. And specifically in healthcare and digital health, they're getting the kind of customer feedback about every aspect of their business that they may or may not have had. It's been a tremendous success for the companies that have done it. Unusually, we, we don't take any equity for that. We do charge small fees, but we don't take any equity for that. And most companies come in, as you said earlier, sort of thinking they're ready for seed investments. We kind of have a show of hands and everybody raises their hands. Yes, I'm also out raising seed money. And by the end of that, they all, no one really raises their hand. They say, I now know what I need to do. Either I'm close to being ready now that I've done this, or I now know what else I need to do in the next two to three to four months so that I can really go out and use my time efficiently. And when I go to raise a seed round, I'm going to be successful at doing that. So they're not all super early companies. They're all, uh, they, some of them could be from around the world. We just saw a whole slew of them at at a couple of conferences over in Europe that are coming over in January for the program. But it's really designed to get them on the end to be ready for institutional investment and know all the things about their business that they need to in order to be successful at that because it's hard. And most of them aren't ready. And most companies spend months and months and months, uh, sometimes years looking for money and never really actually ready to, to close that kind of round. And so some of those companies have ended up being portfolio companies. We've got three of those that have come out of the Ground Zero program that have been become portfolio companies now. But um, even one of those you know, took another six or seven months to go out and figure out everything else they needed to do to get that seed round done before we invested. So that's what it's about. And we have another one. We have one starting here in mid-January. It will be our next one. So you mentioned the one that starts in January. When are they run throughout the year and when are applications open where people can try to become part of it? Yeah, so applications are open now. We've already got seven or eight companies that are participating in that one. That's we'll, we'll probably won't do more than ten. So we do have openings for a few more companies. We typically do them about every six months. So the next one will, will be out in mid-year. We don't have a date for that one yet, but this next one starts January seventeenth, and the the intensive part runs for a month, and then many of those companies will end up staying here for an extra month or two, and we continue to do office hours with them throughout that period of time. So they're really trying to further their businesses. Excellent. Well, you sent across a document about this whole program, this uh, Ground Zero program that Launchpad Digital Health is running. So I'll make sure I include that on the show notes. People can go there and download that and get in touch to uh, apply to be a part of the program. Excellent. Fred, I've got six questions that I'd like to ask every guest. Do you have a few more minutes for me? Sure. All right, Fred, what is a saying, quote, or phrase that motivates you? Saying, quote, or phrase that motivates me. This This was taped to my... My Macintosh computer at Volpe, and I still go by this, um, most people don't know that it's attributed to Abraham Lincoln, but he said specifically, things may come to those who wait, but only the things left by those who hustle. And so that means every day you better be doing something because there's not going to be much left around if you sit around and wait. And, and uh, in a startup environment, that's absolutely necessary. What advice do you have for others working to innovate in healthcare? So... Uh, I've got a lot of it, but to keep it short, um, whether you're disrupting from within the healthcare system or without outside the healthcare system, bring ideas to the traditional healthcare ecosystem that really weren't grown up in the system, things from the outside. And I think a lot of the companies in digital health are trying to disrupt and they're bringing ideas from technology or or other businesses and they're trying to apply it to healthcare and we're helping them do that. What's a book that you recommend to our listeners? I knew you were going to ask this question, and I got three. Can I do three? Sure. Okay. The first one is a book called Against the Gods, The Remarkable Story of Risk. It's by Peter Bernstein. 
And uh, it's a tremendous history of how we've de-risked so many things in society from uh, the ships that used to crash all the time in, in the early year, days of shipping to the way we manage risk today. And it's a phenomenal read. Uh, the second one, Moonshot by Jay Barbary. And it's a story of, you know, how the hell we got people on the moon and what the implications were. And uh, it's a fascinating read. And then the third one, back to Abraham Lincoln, Team of Rivals uh, by Doris Kearns Goodwin. And anyone who is trying to manage a team of people, great thing about Lincoln is he brought in people from with totally different opinions on lots of subjects, and he put them in a room and he had them argue all the time, and then he made great decisions. And so it's a great lesson for any any startup CEO to read that book and understand history and, and how he was able to do it. So those are my three. What's a piece of tech that you would recommend to our listeners? It could be anything from a great coffee machine that you use to a, a cycling app to you know something you have on your computer. So I didn't think this was going to be my answer, but uh, my daughter's last Christmas gave me the uh, Amazon Alexa. And while we've used it periodically off and on, we've, we've the last six months been using it a lot. It sits in our kitchen and we use it for all kinds of things. And, um, and even one of our companies, Stop, Breathe, and Think, is, is now the meditation skill on the Alexa. And so uh, it's becoming a lot more useful and I think people should try it. What's the sort of thing that you like to use it for? You said you've been increasing the usage of it. What are the sort of things that you ask Alexa to do for you? Well, everybody in the family, you know, talk, shouts out stuff to Alexa all the time. It's everything from music to recipes to facts to, you know, it's become one of the primary ways of searching for information, uh, doing daily meditations. You know, there, there are so many things uh, you can do on it. And I think the more you actually engage with it, the more you figure out, wow, this, this can do a lot more than I thought it could. And so we're always finding new stuff. If I gave you a check for $5 million for you to invest in health technology today, how would you invest it? This is an easy one. I'd put it into our fund because we have a lot of great companies we're investing in. But, um, you know, look, we're playing, uh, it's a portfolio strategy at Launchpad Digital Health. That's where I'd put the $5 million because we're finding great entrepreneurs running great companies with great ideas very early on before anybody else does. And we're backing them. And it's a great place to put capital. And I think there's going to be huge returns from it. Launchpad Digital Health. Go invest there. And last thing is, we make a contribution to a charity in appreciation of your time on the show. What charity have you selected? And can you tell me a little bit about what they do? Sure. My wife is on a couple of the committees for a group called Contra Costa Interfaith Housing. And everyone knows uh, homeless problems in all the big cities are a big issue, and particularly here in California. And Contra Costa County is where I live, and this is the biggest organization that houses homeless families. So they have after-school programs for kids, uh, they have rehabilitation programs, the people, the families they move in, and the three different facilities that they run, big complexes, actually have an ownership stake in that they're all required uh, to have a primary uh, wage earner in the family, and so job retraining, and, and they put them to work, and then they contribute I, th I believe it's about a third of their income to housing. And so they have a real stake in the, uh, in the whole enterprise and they become really contributing members of society and it's really transforming people's lives. We've been involved with it for about 10 years and they're really doing great stuff. So that's Contra Costa Interfaith Housing at ccinterfaithhousing.org. So we'll make a donation to that organization and encourage others who are moved to do that to make a contribution as well thanks for nominating them and highlighting their work there i appreciate the contribution thank you fred how can people follow you and keep track of your progress uh if you want to submit an application info at launchpdh.com is the email address info at launchpdh.com uh, you can follow me on twitter at fred launch pdh at fred launch pdh or uh, our website is launchpdh.com as well. So we have a lot of updates there. You can see our portfolio companies and, and things that we're doing. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for coming on the show and adding all this perspective to our listeners. Is there anything else you'd like to say before I let you go? Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing. And we're just having a lot of fun here in San Francisco at Launchpad Digital Health. And we would encourage people to check us out and, and put in an application if they're interested. There you have it. That was Fred Tony, CEO and co-founder of Launchpad Digital Health. We have a load of links in the show notes for this episode. You can find that at digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 53. There we have links to all the companies in the Launchpad Digital Health portfolio, including the seven companies with female CEOs, 
We have the information there that you can download about the Ground Zero program. We also embedded the year-end report from Startup Health. So go check that out and find out where the investment money went in 2017 and what's expected for the year ahead. We have more great guests in store for future episodes. We have Christian Seal, who's giving us an update on what's happening on the digital health scene in Miami. We have Blood and Rees of the ECH Alliance, who tells us about the Digital Health Society, plus a great roundtable discussion with Leah Von Bitter of Ava Science and Greg Sommer of Track Fertility, where we talk about the team sport of conceiving a child. You won't want to miss it. Be sure to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast app. And of course, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes. It helps to build our digital health community and reach other innovators working to transform healthcare. Don't forget to check out Bayer and the new Grants for Apps Generator program. Applications are open until March 23rd. You can find the link on our website or go straight to g4agenerator.com. Follow me on Twitter at HealthTechDan and follow the show at dhealthtoday. And of course, you can always contact me the old-fashioned way on email at dan at digitalhealthtoday.com. That's all for me for now. Speak with you soon on episode 54. And until next time, keep on innovating.